hello my wonderful friends in Monet Cafe. I'm so excited because I got to paint this morning and it was just such a beautiful time. I decided to do a, a long format as you can see here and I always like these either very long vertical or horizontal formats but join me today because I'm going to show you how you can create this painting with using watercolor and soft pastel. This is a beautiful little watercolor set that a precious friend sent me. Her name's Marisa. She is on our Facebook group and Mogan Nay Cafe art group. She's so precious to send me. I love this set. So get started with me and let's do it. Oh, and I had to have my cup of coffee in my Monet Cafe coffee cup. You can get yours if you would like it. You can find it on my website, susanjenkinsfineart.com, or I'll also provide a link in this video. Now, I'm just doing a sketch here on a piece of U art paper. That's the letter U, A R T paper. It's a sanded paper. It feels like sandpaper. And that's the type of paper you need for pastel painting. I mean, you can use pastels on regular paper, but it's just not going to have the same effect. You're not going to get the results. So you art paper is one I love. This is a 400 grit paper. Now, this is a set of watercolors that I love. I mentioned that a dear friend got me and I'm going to show you how you can use uh, watercolor combined with pastel on this UART paper. It works great. Now I've slowed this down to real time. I had it just a little bit faster before just to get through that initial phase. But this is real time because I want to share with you how I'm doing this technique. I've sketched in the flowers that I know you can't see very good and what I had to do is obviously the photo that's um, from pmp-art.com. It's a great website where you can find uh, uh, copyright free photos to work from and uh, I really like their, their site for, you know, when I don't have a field of poppies to <laughs> go and take pictures of. So I was basically having to take a more of a regular type of portrait composition, as in the photo there, and um, rearrange it for this long vertical format. And I decided to kind of cascade the poppies and really emphasize the long stems that they had. So what I've done here is I've put water, you saw me brushing water, around the poppies. Okay, so now I'm just getting a little bit of a, a background color um, and I've decided against having the field go way back like you see in the photo. I decided to have it a sky behind it. That's the neat thing about being an artist. You, you have your artistic license and once you've done enough painting you start to get a little more confidence of I'd rather that be a sky than you know uh, fading out into the dark like the photo does. And the photo is beautiful too. You could have painted it just like that. But all I'm doing now you'll see the water that I already put down you can kind of see it dripping it acts like a channel. Um, the watercolor paint that you put on now is going to follow that water that you already laid down. Um, so I often use this technique. It's called wet on wet in watercolor, um, but I like the using the uh, advantage of gravity because that's how things grow. If you notice flowers and trees, everything reaches up to the heavens. And so when you have your paint dripping down vertically like that, it's going to beautifully emulate um, that fact of nature. Um, so I like to do that. Now, as you can see, I've I put in the purple up top to you know kind of represent the sky uh, because I didn't want to put blue down. I wanted the color to have some pizzazz. So when I add the blue with pastels, it's going to create some interest in color, not just blue everywhere. Um, so now I'm continuing to work and I'm noticing in the photo, there's some areas that are darker, but if you see um, kind of that in the photo, the main poppy, I would say is kind of to the upper right. Uh, behind it looks a little lighter green. It's more like where the sun is shining. So I decided to use more of a uh, yellowy green here and uh, make that be a little bit brighter in that section. And so as you can see, I'm just gradually working around the poppies here to create the background. One of the things I like to point out what I love about this technique and what I love about watercolor in general is it has this beautiful way of being so luminous and so um, the color is just light and beautiful and it's not it's uh, translucent rather than opaque. And when you add pastels, no matter how much you try to make it look translucent, they are opaque. I mean, you can create the illusion of uh, luminescence, uh, but watercolor has that as its natural ability. So often when I use watercolor and pastels, I try to remember that 
there's something, rather than just creating an underpainting, there's something I want to preserve about that beautiful luminosity. Now, I'm adding these cooler greens. Um, they're more of a bluish green down in the bottom because that's where like the roots are. It's getting down deeper. If you look in the photo, you can see where there's the dark areas down um, where the stems are going down to the ground. So I know that's going to be cooler. I know it's going to be more in shadow. Later, I'm going to add with pastel and make this uh, darker. Um, but for now, you know, that's a, a nice way to get that uh, color temperature correct with the watercolor. All right, now notice that water's dirty. I talked about preserving, preserving the luminosity. Oh, I've sped this up again. I'm, I cleaned off my little uh, palette tray and now I'm going to use these colors for the poppies. So I needed the clean water to do that. I didn't want to put that muddy water down there. So I, I'm speeding it up now. But um, again, you see that drip just drip down? It's really not a big deal. I don't even need to wipe it off. You kind of want your, your flowers to um, break outside of their edges sometimes. Otherwise, your painting looks very tight and stiff and fussy. Um, so now I'm getting my lightest light because I want to get that that beautiful orangey yellow color that's in the poppies um, and I want to keep that in mind while I'm painting. I don't want to lose that right there because that flower is going to be the star of the show. And um, But I'm getting in some of the others. Now because it was wet, because I already put the water down, notice how it's running and dripping and it actually, see how that just made it look so much more artistic than if I had just uh, laborious, laboriously painted watercolor on the dry paper and tried to get it so detailed, it wouldn't have that that looseness and that freshness. Uh, it just looks so much more painterly and artistic when you put the water down first. So I love that. I love that um, of just kind of letting the water um, do the painting. You know, it's pretty cool. Um, so anyway, again, putting more of the yellow down. I want to keep that um, freshness there and uh, adding a little bit more of the oranges and the reds and I am making I like to call these like color notes I'm putting down colors where I know how the shapes of the flowers are how they're positioned and so that's going to help me later uh, another interesting thing oh yeah those drips it's it's no big deal really when you get to painting and, and again I kind of like it um, another thing um, to remember with watercolor is that they dry lighter than they go on. So you can already notice that poppy at the top, it's already lighter. Um, the colors aren't as bold as they were when I originally put them down. So you can be a little bold when you put them down at first and know that they're going to tone down. Um, but you can always go back over watercolor and enhance the color if you were just doing a watercolor painting. You see how those nice drips, again, like I mentioned, how nature just seems to um, have the, everything reaching up so the, the gravity is helping those poppies kind of do that. Um, but anyway, you can always go back over if you were just doing a watercolor painting, intensify the color and everything, but this is just an underpainting. It's giving me um, just a little guide to how I'm going to lay my pastels down. And also, again, trying to just keep a little bit of that beauty of watercolor. All right, so enjoy this rest of this watercolor process, and I will pop back in when we add the pastel. about to wrap up the watercolor portion and I want to just um, stress that this is not to get fussy with the watercolors. It's just to get a loose interpretation, um, have some fun, and get a groundwork for your pastels. Now, here are the pastels I chose. Look how out of order they are. 
that's because I guess you could say I cheated or I just did what was easy. These were just the pastels I had used on some previous paintings. And again, I did this painting that, um, this particular morning and I just wanted to paint. I didn't want to put them away or anything. So a little random and sporadic. But now the watercolor paper is dry and it still has that nice sanded surface. That's another neat thing about using watercolor on this paper. It doesn't take up any of the tooth of the pastel. And if you've been using pastels for a while, you know that's something we want to preserve. Now I just added the other piece of paper next to it. Some of you have commented in previous videos, you like to see me do mark making with these pastels uh, to kind of see what color it is. And uh, also sometimes I'm cleaning my pastel off and checking color and sometimes getting a smooth surface. Some of these pastels, uh, particularly that one right there, like the Jack Richesons, um, they have little bumps on them sometimes on the edges. I break my pastels, that's why they look smaller and uh, I have to kind of smooth them out. So here I'm using a combination of blues, uh, warm and cool blues. And I'm choosing these of a similar value, meaning the lightness or the darkness. Notice how I'm doing it real light touch here. I kind of want to preserve that little bit of lavender behind it. But when, by using this combination of blues, that's like the, uh, the cooler blue, I'm sorry, um, that's the warmer blue. That's got more green in it, it's teal. I'm pulling it down into the grasses a little bit. But that play on color, when you have similar values but different colors, it's gonna create a much more energetic appearance. And so I love that. So that's why I chose those three colors there to uh, work for the sky. It just, see how the color is just kind of more dynamic? Now, these are the colors that I've chosen for the poppies. I basically have the darkest dark. I might, I actually end up getting one a little bit dark. See how that is? I, I'm, I actually, let me show you. I'm gonna do a trick right here. That one needed to be broken. It was a little too wide for my application. So that's a cigar cutter. No, I don't smoke cigars, but someone told me this is an excellent way Ta-da! To break pastels. It gives a clean cut. So what I did is now it's a little bit smaller for me to kind of lay that down and I had to kind of smooth off that little edge that was on there. They're, they've got little ridges on them and I'm, again, even right here, it's not really smooth for me to work with. Um, but anyway, I'm putting down my darkest shadowy era areas. If you look in the photo, you see that on the back sides, more on our side of the flowers, is where you see that um, darker area. These, I guess you would say, are kind of backlit. The sunshine is on the opposite side. So um, again, same as with the sky, you want to play on colors here. So I put down, these are different values though, not unlike the sky. So I put down the darkest dark for the shadowy area, and then I'm putting down um, more of a orangey red, a little bit more orangey red, um, to uh, go on top of that darker color. Um, and then I just continue to work. But one of the things I wanted to mention is I'm trying to <clears throat> preserve that really bright area. I talked about that the watercolor is so beautiful at doing, keeping that lightness. And I want to keep that lightness there. I do end up adding a pastel that is um, more golden yellow, but that is reminding me that that's what I want to preserve. That's what I want to um, really show up is that beautiful light that's um, shining through that poppy petal. Um, so I'm just continuing to work and now I am a little more focused on getting um, shapes of the poppies. I don't want to get too fussy, especially with the ones I don't want the main focus to be on, like the ones that are going to be buried in the grasses. They're just going to have like, I mean, they can almost just be a, um, a little rectangular shape sometimes. They don't even have to be a um, distinct flower because you have control as the artist as to where your viewer's eye goes and you want it to um, comfortably just follow the path that you want it to go and you control that by where you put the detail. So obviously this flower here is going to be the most detailed. Now I'm, I'm making some petals that are kind of um, reaching out um, and shaping it like I said and I realize later you'll notice later, I've got that one, I think it's because I got the watercolor too close. The, the one right underneath that main one is, uh, it's too close. Later I, I separate it more with some sky uh, because it was a little too jumbled up there and it was taking the interest away from that main flower. All right, so I'm gonna continue to work on these. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see what I'm doing and enjoy the music.
now I'm reinforcing, or actually enforcing, <laughs> because there weren't many darks down there to begin with, but uh, making it darker down by the roots on the ground. The ground is typically uh, darker, especially down at the roots of the flowers like that. So I'm just kind of getting in um, a variety of dark values with different colors. I've got one that was a little bit more burgundy brownish. I've got one that's a little more blue and it's going to look kind of dark right now, but it'll eventually lighten up when I add more greens and layers on top of it. Um, and now I'm, I'm getting in some of those cooler colors that are kind of in the shadows a little bit. And then I'll add the warmer greens on top of those colors. I do end up blending um, some of these roots a little bit on <laughs> the dark part there. Um, you'll see in a minute where I do that. I decided later, that little one there, I was going to have a few little flowers popping up, but I thought, you, if you saw the beginning um, painting, um, I decide later to make it a bee. I thought that would be a lot more interesting, and I realized the top area of the sky needed a little something up there, so I added another bee up on top of that one poppy. <music> where I'm using a piece of pipe foam insulation that you can buy at any hardware store or most hardware stores and uh, I wanted to kind of get away from that really um, high texture um, darker values down towards the roots of the flowers so I'm kind of blending around the flowers and even kind of blending uh, into the lower flowers I want those flowers to be a little more hidden in appearance, in appearance, so not every flower is appearing as floating on the surface. By the way, I've heard you can also use a pool noodle as a blending tool. There's various things you can use to blend. I uh, encourage you to limit your blending, uh, use it purposefully um, in certain areas. Now this is a technique I learned from artist Karen Margolis. She uses this um, low odor workable fixative. This is by Blair, Blair Low Odor Fixative. And I love how she uses it and it, add, it darkens where you want it to darken and it adds another little layer like a sheen over your painting so that you can glaze grasses on top of it so it will bury those flowers. So that's a great thing about using fixative uh, in that way. I get asked this question all the time. How do you fix your paintings or how do you get your final paintings to where, you know, um, they can be sold or you can um, frame them? And I advise you to do nothing to them. Don't spray them when you're done with any fixative. I use clear bags to store my paintings in. I have a method that I use uh, before I get them in a bag. Um, I just put them in between sheets of glassine uh, in a big uh, sketchbook. If, I, if you have a big sketchbook, you can put your paintings and just put a piece of glassine. It looks like wax paper, but glassine is a good way to protect your paper until you get it into a clear bag. Um, now, I'm adding purple here because that's just going to be so much more interesting than just all those greens. Let me zoom in a little bit. Can you see how that purple just added, I don't know, it just looks magical. <laughs> so sometimes if you add a color that is not what you would commonly think of in a bunch of grasses, um, like a purple or a teal. Um, you just kind of make it pop a little bit. You know, that's my 
my go-to word, make your colors pop. <laughs> but um, again, I just added a little bit of a teal there. So it generates a lot more interest and, um, and beauty in your painting. I'm, now I am reinforcing the darks. I'm adding just a little bit more um, where some of those roots would be. Sometimes I do this more at the beginning, but occasionally I will um, add it in uh, carefully, you know, towards the end when I've already established uh, much of the painting. mentioned about putting in the bee, replacing that little flower pod um, with a bee. I basically just use a stiff bristle brush and I just brush off the majority of the pastel that's kind of on the surface of the sanded paper. I put a little bit of the blue over it um, so that I can later add the bee. I kind of have that little fractionated color there so I add a little bit of, of the other colors as well. Now I wanted to show you this. Often we can repurpose things. This is a case that I had a screen protector for my phone in. My husband happened to actually say, that would make a nice little pastel storage case. And I knew it wouldn't work for most pastels, but it works great for these new pastels, NU pastels. They're harder pastels that are great for doing stems, for doing grasses, and uh, sometimes little detail work. Um, so I just keep a little selection of pastels in this case right now, um, and it works great for me. Now, this poppy, I'm doing a kind of a, a broken um, uh, line, a little fragmented line. Uh, you don't want anything being so straight and um, stiff looking. So I'm doing it darker, and um, then I'll add a little highlight on one side of it, uh, because those stems, if you notice in the photo, they have a little glow around them. Again, they're kind of backlit. So um, you get, and my edges to my pastels are always a little odd, so I have to be a little careful about making sure I get it right. Now, uh, again, I think that main poppy that's up at the highest point is in the front, and I decide in a minute, I'll go ahead and hop to that right now, to, um, sep yep, uh, there I am, right there, um, to separate it a little bit and make that one petal smaller on the big flower. I just feel like they're too bunched up there. I wanted a little uh, room between it. So I'm doing kind of the same technique I did before where I use a stiff brush, brush it out. Um, I still have plenty of layering capability here. So I'm just very easily able to layer some of that blue over it and uh, kind of give a little separation for those flowers. And now I'm using some more of the new pastels, the harder pastels to add a few more grasses. I've kind of successfully gotten the flowers a little more buried by adding some of those uh, more warm greens on top after I had applied that uh, workable fixative. So you wanna be random with your grasses. You don't want them all just straight lines sticking up. Sometimes you wanna add a little variety. Like here I'm adding like some little uh, uh, flower pods, the little uh, blossoms before they open. And then I'll just add a little highlight you know, wherever the sun may be hitting them. Here I am using a new pastel to kind of reinforce some of the uh, texture of the flower and uh, make it a little bit more believable as to where some of the little ripples or ridges are in the flower. And the new pastel works great for that because it's small enough to kind of see what you're doing for one. And they're a bit more 
uh, have a more ability to make more of a fine mark, uh, detailed mark, than your chunkier soft pastels do. Okay, here's where I'm going to add the little bees. And really with bees, the less detail, the better. For one, when we're watching bees, they're so fast, they don't have uh, a lot of detail to our eyes. They're moving around. You want to capture that movement. Also, they're so small, you can't see their detail a lot. And uh, you want your eye to focus on the flowers, and the bees are like the accent. Sorry for my head there. I can't see what I'm doing sometimes. I'm going to zoom in so you can see a little bit more detail. I'm sorry I thought my camera was going when it didn't. I basically just make three little black marks. One's the head, one's the thorax, is that what it's called? And then one's the back part of the bee. I add a little combination of a darker orange and then a lighter orange on top of that. Then I just use a blue or almost a white um, to make a couple of little wings. And again, you just want them uh, very impressionistic and no big deal. Now I get a new pastel to make a little, I don't always do this, but a little indication of maybe their feet and uh, feet, <laughs> their legs. I don't think bees have feet. Um, and perhaps their little antenna. And again, you don't want to overdo this because you're not trying to draw too much attention for the, to the bee. They're just nice little accents. So this was fun, bees and poppies, and just a, a beautiful celebration of God's world. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you want more videos and lessons in the convenience of your own home. So thanks guys. As always, happy painting.